This week on the Back Table Podcast. Globally, we do see ourselves as like a natural, holistic, reflux therapy type company. Right now, we're just trying to get the brand out there. We're focusing a lot on education to fill in the gaps for a lot of patients who don't understand. And it's not just pushing algin, it's, it's making sure people do understand all of the things that you can do. And that's been a big portion of our social media outreach is just the educational component. I would love it if everybody stayed on an alginate forever from a financial standpoint, but an since I'm a doctor first and a co-founder second. And so like, we just want to get people better. And this is hopefully another way we can help them do that. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Back Table ENT Podcast. We're a podcast that focuses on all things otolaryngology, and we've got a really great show for you today. Thanks for stopping by. My name is Ashley Agan. I'm a general ENT. I will be your host today. And I'm very excited to be interviewing one of our fellow ENT colleagues, a physician entrepreneur, the co-founder of the product Reflux Raft, which we're going to get into and talk a lot about today. But first, just let me introduce him. We have Dr. Spencer Payne. He was born and raised in Poughkeepsie, New York. After graduating from medical school at Stony Brook University in New York, he then completed his residency training in otolaryngology head and neck surgery at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. He completed his fellowship training at the Leahy Clinic in Burlington, Massachusetts in rhinology and sinus surgery with a focus on endoscopic sinus and skull base surgery. He is currently a tenured professor of the Department of Otolaryngology at UVA. And he's here today to talk to us about reflux, to talk about product development. We're going to talk about reflux raft. Welcome to the show, Spencer. Oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and I, I look forward to the, the conversation. Yeah. So first, before we get into it, tell our listeners just a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what your practice is like now, a little bit more about you. Yeah. As you mentioned, I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, and I was the oldest of four kids. I have a twin brother who lives in New Jersey. We look nothing alike. We're complete opposites almost. Yeah. So I've been in Charlottesville, Virginia now for, gosh, I think this is my 17th year that I've been here. Single job out of training, which is kind of unheard of these days. And so I've been having a good time in Charlottesville. It's, a, it's an amazing place to live and, and raise a family. I've got four kids, two daughters and two boys. The oldest just started college and the youngest just started first grade. So it's a bit of a span, so it keeps me busy, but it's been fun. But yeah, I've been the director of sinus surgery at, at UVA since I've been here. And so my practice primarily focuses on sinusitis, nasal polyps, nasal tumors, that type of thing. So, you know, I'll do a little bit of general here and there when, when patients come to me, but primarily the practice is pretty restricted. So, and since I've been at UVA, I've had the pleasure of working with an allergist here, Larry Borish, who's been kind of world international famous for nasal polyps. And so I've worked with him a lot on aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. And as you and many of our listeners may know, there's a big correlation with alcohol sensitivity in that disease. And so that ended up being a big part of my research and which led me down a pathway of alcoholic beverages and why are certain alcoholic beverages different than others? And what are the health benefits? Are there health benefits of alcoholic beverages? We did studies on the polyphenols in those alcoholic beverages, and it really started me thinking about diet and a lot of those things. And along the same time, like my father died when I was pretty young. He died when I was 19. And so it was a couple of years ago, I was sitting there going like, I am only about four or five years from the age when he passed away. And so like all of this stuff was kind of like coming together in terms of like studying about the alcoholic beverages, looking at like control for sinusitis and nasal polyps. What am I going to do so I stay healthy for my four kids? And all this stuff was coming together. And I started looking very heavily into diet and kind of more holistic approaches to health and stuff like that, which led me down the pathway of well, a variety of fad type of diets. But you know, I was clean keto for a while and, and then looking heavily into functional medicine. And then in, during COVID, I ended up studying functional medicine and learning all about like kind of aspects of naturopathy and dietary control and mind-body connections and all that kind of stuff. And then that kind of has led me into shaping a lot of my practice and offering kind of some alternative options for patients. And we'll get into a little bit more how that may have funneled my way into to reflux raft and, and that type of thing. So Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. I don't think I realized that AERD patients had an alcohol sensitivity. Yeah. So like all alcoholic beverages or any like 
Yeah, it's seventy five percent of them will have either an upper or lower respiratory symptom with it. Red wine seems to be the strongest, and then beer, and then liquors can also do it. But among the liquors, it's the brown liquors more so than the clear liquors. Okay. And it's the red wine more than the white wines, and it's the oak fermented whites more so than the steel fermented whites. And so that's what got me all into thinking about the polyphenols and the contributions from the grape skins or the hops or the oak barrels and all that kind of stuff. And so most of our experiments have shown that that's probably the case. So. Oh, that's fascinating. So as the, the sinus surgeon in your group, how do you know patients with reflux usually present for you? Are they having more, you know, nasal symptoms or post-nasal drainage or what are you seeing in your clinic? Yeah. The thing I always joke with people about is they just come in and they say, doc, I got sinus. And then we've got to dive down into like, what does that mean? But it's a lot of post-nasal drip or post-nasal drip chronic cough. It must be my sinuses or patients with a lot of gram negative, like recurrent sinusitis or failing to improve with standard therapies after sinus surgery. And we dive down into, do you have heartburn? Do you have reflux? And for a lot of these patients, it's silent reflux. You know, it's the laryngopharyngeal reflux. They don't have the heartburn. And then you've got to talk to them about like, well, you don't have heartburn, but that doesn't mean you don't have reflux. Well, I didn't get better on a PPI. So, you know, I don't have reflux. And you're like, well, okay, but that only stops one aspect of the reflux. And so I work with a lot of them on on that type of thing. Yeah, I think that's really common in my practice as well, where either patients say, no, I definitely don't have reflux. I don't have that. I don't have heartburn, you know? Yeah. Or they're like, well, I'm already on pentobrazole or I'm already, you know, I, I take that. Yeah, because I have GERD or whatever it is. How do you think about reflux, like from a functional medicine perspective? Or is it the same as we would think about it in kind of modern traditional methods? Well, I mean, I think kind of the jaded allopath in me to a certain extent is a lot of people think reflux, you have reflux, here's a pill, right? Here's your PPI. Here's here's this medication that you were, that was originally designed to be taken for six weeks for an ulcer. And now we're just going to use it to treat your heartburn. And so that's not very functional or an H2 blocker, which at this point we're down to just famotidine. And so, but that's, that's not a functional approach. That's not a, well, why are you refluxing? Is it a hiatal hernia? Is it your diet? Is it your weight? Is it bile salts? Do you actually have hypochlorhydria? You know, are you not actually making enough acid and now you just have an upset stomach and dyspepsia because of other things going awry? And so just throwing a PPI at people, I think, misses the boat. And so you've got to really approach these patients, you know, where they're at in terms of like, okay, well, what are you eating? And like, what are your your habits like? It was one patient, I was almost flabbergasted. He's like, no, my diet's fine. And the wife was like, you stop at McDonald's every morning and get two sausage beef muffins and like an Uber-sized coffee. And he's like, yeah. And (laughs) you just kind of hang your head and realize, okay, well, we've got a lot to work on here. Yeah, I agree. I think there's, and there's a lot of conflicting information out there, you know, like with different fad diets that are coming out. And, you know, one day it's like butter and sausage eggs is that's, right. that's all you need to eat. Everything else is bad or it's all over the place. Do you find that there's, when you're counseling patients about diet is in general, is there one diet that works well for most? Or is it like really to where you're going to be individually looking at diets like person by person? And for some patients, you know, you mentioned the ERD patient, you may have to like eliminate your alcohol. Like, how do you think about that kind of prescribing dietary changes for your reflux patients? I think a big thing I try to first get them to is much more of a whole food type diet as opposed to processed food, something out of a box or a can. And then reading labels. It's amazing how many people don't read the labels, have no idea what's in the food. I mean, there was the one study that looked at Mediterranean diet and alkaline water being as symptomatically beneficial as a PPI. And so I do try to steer more towards a Mediterranean diet and then counsel them that that doesn't mean all the pasta you can eat. It's just more fish-based and vegetable. And as one show I had seen on one of the streaming platforms, you know, and it was always this like, eat a healthy diet, mostly plants, sometimes meat, that type of thing. With AERD patients, they actually benefit from studies from really high omega-3 type diets because of the anti-inflammatory component of that. And so let's get rid of the processed food. Let's get rid of the added sugar. Let's get rid of a big source of red meat and omega-6s and start there. And then it's just a matter of portion control and timing. And like you can eat certain things, but maybe not at 10 p.m. 
then we dig in with some people about like, well, could there be dairy issues or gluten? And we could have a whole other podcast on non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but that's beyond that scope today. But, you know, we dig into that stuff though, too. So basically, in general, getting rid of processed food as much as you can and trying to eat food that looks like what it is. <laughs> you can tell by yeah, looking exactly. at the ingredients. <laughs> a carrot yeah. is a carrot, and there's not 100 ingredients that you can't pronounce on the packaging. Okay, so there's the diet part of it. You mentioned not eating late at night, so giving your stomach a chance to empty before you're laying down. Is that Does that matter? Is that a pretty uh, significant part? Yeah, that's a big part. I mean, three to four hours from your last meal before you lay down. And I talk to patients a lot and I say like, I don't mean before you go to bed. I mean, before you lay down, because then there's everybody who's lying in bed, watching TV, crumped up, abdomen folded like an accordion on pillows, watching TV, you know, for two hours. And so I just say, you know, it's like, stay upright for a couple of hours. And when you're lying down, it's getting on a, maybe on a little ramp or head of bed elevation, but not on five pillows where you're crunching the stomach. And then Sleeping on your side, left side down has been shown to improve or decrease reflux events and, and those types of things. You know, it's funny because I was talking to one of my residents and he just happens to be Jewish, but we were just talking about how he was saying even the Talmud, I think, I may be getting this wrong as to which, which book it was. But he goes, well, you know, it says like you should sleep on your left side. And at yogic and Ayurvedic medicine says sleep on your left side. Modern medicine for reflux says sleep on your left side. Like this is something we've known for thousands of years, right? But like now we're counseling patients about it and they're all like, oh, I should sleep on my left side. And you're like, yeah, it turns out yeah. everybody <laughs> thinks left side this down is better. In. <laughs> yeah, this just in. Yeah. <laughs> Any other non-pharmacologic modifications that you talk to your patients about? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a bunch of natural options that, you know, depending on what you consider pharmacologic, I think it's a sticky wicket when you start talking about naturopathy to a certain extent, because you're just saying like, all right, well, I'm not going to give you this synthetic drug. I'm going to give you this natural drug, but I'm still handing you a drug, right? So I had a patient the other day who was like, oh no, I chew on willow bark. I'm like, yeah, that's aspirin. It's still not great for you all the time, but there's a lot of natural things that can help with digestion. I mean, we've probably, most of us have heard of aperitifs and digestifs, right? Which are meant to be taken before the meal and after the meal. Now, granted, there's alcohol in them, but the concept was they were bitter. Most aperitifs and digestifs have a bitterness to them. And that bitterness increases a gastric muscle squeezing, right? Gastric movement, gastro. And so like bittering agents like that, I mean, Swedish bitters, ginger, which is natural anti-inflammatory, but also a prokinetic agent can be used to help with that. That's why ginger ale has been associated with helping with nausea and upset stomach for those reasons. And so we talk about that type of stuff and some of the other natural options like alginates after the meal, and which is why we kind of came up with the reflux raft concept. But yeah, diet, avoiding chocolate, avoiding coffee, avoiding acidic foods if you can, decreasing. I think fat is okay. You know, I think the 80s craze was like low fat diets. And in reality, that just resulted in all of our foods having high processed sugar. So fat's not the enemy, but if you've got reflux, fat can be the enemy because fat does slow down the stomach. So Fat, healthy fats in the diet are fine, but if your maybe your dinner meal shouldn't be the highest fat meal of your day, where things are going to sit there. So, and why are coffee and chocolate a no-no? Well, coffee because it's acidic, and then the caffeine interferes with uh, lower esophageal sphincter tone, and then chocolate is mildly acidic as well, and then has the caffeine in it. And so they do make low acidity coffees. Those are out there. And so that for that person who needs that cup of coffee, it's an option. And milk chocolate might be less acidic, but it's going to be, now you've got processed sugars in that as well, as opposed to your darker chocolates and that kind of thing. So it's there's something sneaking behind. But again, any diet that is too restrictive is not going to be able to be maintained by your patients. And so you have to empower them to make the best choice of the options they're presented with at any time through education and knowledge. And so like, if you're going to have chocolate, know what's going to happen, but these are the things. And again, a lot of this reflex is quality of life. And so I tell patients, I was like, look, I know you enjoy your cigarettes. I know you enjoy your coffee. I know you enjoy your chocolate, but you're also here because you've got this problem and it's not going to kill you, but you have to make the choice and help guide them. Yeah. I'm just letting you know things you can do to maybe feel right. a little bit better and you can take that yeah. information and do yeah. you well. <laughs> what about fiber? Does that matter? Do you talk to patients about fiber? Yeah, I mean, I think fiber is good. I honestly, 
couldn't speak specifically to fiber and reflux. Honestly, I would, I would be guesstimating on that, but I think fiber in the form of a plant-based diet. I mean, if, if you just can't choke down your green vegetables and like added fiber, well, that's in the form of like flaxseed or chia seeds or something like that, fine. But as much as you can increase your, you know, your green vegetables just for all the other benefits and access to iron and kale and calcium and all those things, especially if patients are on PPIs and they're not absorbing calcium as well. And so getting that through your food can be important. And is it necessary to look for like physical, you mentioned like a hiatal hernia. Is it necessary to look for like some sort of physical reason why there's reflux? Or for most patients, you can kind of talk about dietary modifications. And then if if you can't be controlled and go down the road of looking to see if there's like esophageal dysmotility or like these kind of more rare things where they're having reflux events because of something kind of physical or mechanical about their esophagus and stomach. Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely a critical thing to look at in patients whose symptoms who fail to improve with standard therapy. I am probably a minimalist in terms of like that diagnostic workup. And as a rhinologist, I'll admit, I don't necessarily go down that road that far. A lot of times it's, we get them started with that type of thing. And then I may refer to GI or, or our laryngologist swallowing experts to, to see like, Hey, like I've done what I can here. Like, what can you, what can you help me with? So I would say that in terms of guidelines, a an upper GI series is not, you know, recommended for patients with with reflux. So you wouldn't necessarily just get that. But I think so referring to GI if if their reflux fails to improve is a is a good plan. Although then we we run that continual battle if they don't have heartburn and they don't have signs of lower esophageal damage, in essence, GERD is no longer a, an adequate diagnosis as far as GI is concerned. And then it's, well, do they really have reflux? And is it non-acidic reflux? And if what's their demeester scale and score? And, and then you run in, in circles trying to figure out like, okay, well, what's the right answer? Well, I want to talk about kind of the development of reflux raft. And so talk to me, go back to the beginning when you kind of started kicking the idea around and how did this idea come to be and how did you get where you are today? So like a lot of people, I had a lot of time during COVID. And so I was doing, like I said, the functional medicine training I was using, it was going through the, well, they were all online courses because everything in person had been canceled. Like I was actually at the airport about to go to my first course and then they, and then they canceled it. And I was like, okay, all right, well, but over the course of that time, learning about all these other options and that, and that kind of like thinking heavily about the, maybe we shouldn't just be saying, you know, symptom pill. Um, and I really started thinking about it and I remember looking at all the information they were providing around treating reflux and problems with PPIs and the associated downstream side effects, which may just be very bad cross-sectional studies of people in nursing homes, but take it for what it's worth. But as we were coming back out of it, and I was trying to apply a lot of these options to taking care of patients, and I was I remember talking to our laryngologist, Jim De Niro, and he was just like, oh, you know, have you tried alginates for your patients? Like, it's really gaining steam in the laryngology community. And I was like, oh, yeah, like, they actually mentioned that at that course, and like, it would be really great if we, you know, could have something and we talked about some other brands that were on the market. And, and so I started recommending a lot of those. And then, you know, a lot of patients were complaining about like, oh, well, there's a lot of sugar in this, or there's a lot of sodium in this, and or this brand tastes horrible, and it's chalky, and it's hard to get, and da 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 and, and so I was talking to Jim, and I was like, you know, we complain about how PPIs are, you know, even when we take the side effects out of it, like, we're really only addressing one issue, the acid. We're not addressing the reflux. But these alginates seem great, but again, we're not addressing the reflux. We're stopping reflux, but we're not addressing causes with it. We're not helping. It's still a unidimensional product. And I says, wouldn't it be great if we could integrate other kind of like holistic therapies into an alginate-based product and create like the best option for patients? And then, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. learn from what the others have done and try to tweak those things and, and build a better mousetrap, so to speak. And he goes, I love it. I love it. He's like, let's do it. I've been wanting to make my own alginate for a while now. And I was like, awesome, let's go. And the gym has been on the board of a couple of like incubator startup type things in Charlottesville. We've got a, a pretty good community for that. And so 
he was talking to a couple of his colleagues with those and they were like, that sounds amazing. And so like two weeks later, we had a meeting and they were just like, all right, build us a prototype. And so Jim and I hit the kitchen lab. And so I was like, we we're just sitting there with all sorts of ingredients and putting stuff together and immersion blend rain in my mason jars in the kitchen and had all these things lined up, like taped on all of them. Like, here's this formula, here's this one, here's how we tweak this one, da, da, da. And then came up with what we thought was like the perfect one. And, and then I don't think Jim will mind, but me saying this, but he's got bad reflux. And so he's just like, well, if it helps me, I know this thing's going to work. And he was like, this is amazing this is amazing. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, we're ready. He was patient one, right? Yeah. Co-founder and patient one. So we took it back to these guys and, and they're just like, yeah, they're like, oh, this, the consistency is a little weird. We're like, yeah, it's an alginate. Like, there's no way around that. And I'm like, but here are the alternatives. And they're like, oh, so they're all kind of gloppy. And I'm like, they are all, they are all kind of gloppy. And they're like, all right, let's do it. And so then we had kind of like this brain trust of people who had run some other businesses. And they introduced us to a marketing company and they had an intern. And so then we just started researching you know, companies that excelled at like organic, healthy, that's called GCMP manufacturing standards for liquid processing. And so then we found a third party manufacturer and like interviewed several places and found the one that like seemed to be in line with our mission of providing this like natural based, organic, healthy product to help with patients and then got moving. And then it was kind of crazy because like I had taken like one business course during COVID too, that was like marketing. And, you know, at that time I was like, I had no idea marketing was not just advertising. Like to me, marketing equaled advertising. And, you know, it was kind of a mind blowing situation to realize marketing is every step it takes to get your product to market, including like brand mission, product conceptualization, manufacturing, logistics, sales, like all of this stuff. And then, so you're like, oh yeah, like let's make this product. Then all of a sudden it's like, we've got to make it, we've got to bottle it. We've got to label it with FDA requirements. So you've got to dig through all this FDA stuff about like, luckily our product is a food supplement. So we're not dealing with pharmacological types of restrictions, but then it's like, what do you have to put on a label and how much fat, how much sugar, how much of these things is in this stuff? And what does your label have to have? And you have to have the office or where it's manufactured on the label. And the bottle has to either have a manufacture date or an expiration date on it. So all of these things that you've got to like actually think about that you'd never thought about. It was a real kind of crazy thing. And so now it's, then it's okay, well, how do you sell your product? And then like, all right, well, You've got to do Amazon. You can't not do Amazon these days. But there's also there's a reason why there's a lot of people mad at Amazon. And so you try to figure that type of stuff out. And you've got to develop a website. And then how do people buy things on your website? And should you do subscriptions? Then who saves the credit card information? And all these kinds of things that we've been moving along. And so in the end, we had one company that got us started with like the marketing and advertising and the website. And then we picked up another company to kind of like move us forward to the next thing. And so we've, we launched officially, I think product was available October, 2022, when we finally like flicked the switch on the website and in our Amazon. And we lost one of our original colleagues in the process. And so now there's just three of us running the company, all kind of co-founders and then a president. I'm customer service. Jim's in charge of inventory. We've got the marketing company or other partner, Bill Porter, is our president, really chief operations officer in charge of like contract negotiation and, and managing that type of stuff. And so it's just a, it's a whole new world of stuff that I hadn't thought of. And it's like, I was even thinking it the other day, it's like, I show up to the OR and I expect things to be how I want them. And, but you forget like all the time we had put into having it be perfect. And so now like, I want things the way I want them, but like, oh wait, I've got to do all this now. Like can... So it's like in my spare time. So right. you know, people are always like, oh, you've got your side hustle. And I'm like, yeah, it's definitely a hustle because we're hustling, trying to like do the, this stuff and also stay within the confines of not letting it interfere with my day job and then inspiring the ire of either my chair or my school and that type of thing. Yeah. And so it took about two years. You started in 2020 and then launched in 22. 
Yeah, I think it was 2020. Yeah, 2020, we started talking. I think 2021 is when we really started. We met with uh, with the corporate folks, so to speak, and then launched the product. It then took another year to get the product actually to market. So our first product was lemon ginger, which um, has the ginger in it, which I wanted as the anti-inflammatory pro-kinetic agent. And then it's got deglycerizinated licorice, which I still can't spell. I always have to tell Siri deglycerinated and hope that she comes up with it. What does that mean? Yes. So licorice root is used for a lot of reasons, but it's an anti-inflammatory. It's also a thickening agent. It's used as a demulcent or like a, a gel type of a coating. But if you look into it, it's got a lot of potential contraindications, especially with patients on either blood thinners or a loop diuretics, or they've got heart issues. And so there is a, it's for lack of a better word, but probably too technical, a moiety on the licorice root substance that is called glycerizin. And so you deglycerizinate the licorice by taking it off. And once you do that, you get rid of, well, you get rid of the anti-inflammatory component, but then you also get rid of the issue that interacts with all the other problems or creates all those other issues. And so then you're basically just left with the demulcent capacity, the soothing coating. So in that case, it's almost like the licorice is acting like the sucral fate type of scenario. And so people ask like, oh, is this has got licorice in it and I can't take this. I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Like, we, we, And then we've got lemon flavoring, natural lemon flavoring extract. And then people always say like, oh, but no, you're not supposed to have lemon if you've got a reflux diet. And I'm like, yes, it's the citric acid that you don't need, but we've got, these are the natural oils and flavoring. So hope with that product, that's a pretty good soup to nuts thing. And then like literally it was just maybe less than a month ago, we finally dropped our second product, which was because I really wanted to do a reflux raft PM. In the rest of the world, PM means we've added diphenhydramine, aka Benadryl, but melatonin, which a lot of people use naturally for as a sleep aid, is also good for lower esophageal sphincter tone. So we created a product with melatonin in it for bedtime use. Our midnight berry, which then has blueberry and ossie berry for polyphenolic and anti-inflammatory antioxidant parsesis. So that one's starting to pick up speed too. Yeah. Sounds delicious. I want to yeah. back up a little bit, just speaking about alginates, for our listeners who aren't familiar with that class, because I think in training, we talked about, you know, the PPIs are really common, the H2 blockers, maybe Tums, but this class of alginates, like what's it made out of? How does it work? How is it different from the other drugs? Yeah. And so alginates, as they may sound, actually come from algae, which a lot of people are familiar with what blue green algae is, like the stuff that floats on ponds, but brown algae or brown kelp are like the bigger, like the seaweed type things that you see in the ocean. And so alginates, it's technically a polysaccharide, but in essence, it's such a long chain that's not broken down by the body. So it's actually a fiber. And then what happens is when you take an alginate along with a calcium source, when it hits the stomach acid, it cross links and you get a hydrogel. So it actually forms a gel. And for the molecular gastronomy fans out there, alginates are what are used to create like, you know, like boba tea and like all of the spiracles that float in like fancy foods and things. And so it's a gelling agent in essence. And so what you get is a gel, but it's not simple enough to have a gel because if you just swallow a gel, it does nothing. So for an alginate to work, then you also have to have a carbonate source. And then when that interacts with the stomach acid, you get CO2. CO2 becomes incorporated in the gel and the gel floats or rafts on the stomach contents and then serves as a physical barrier so that when reflux is going to occur, it's the gel that either plugs the esophagus or what goes up is this inert substance as opposed to an acid, an enzyme, or a bile salt. And so the concept of using alginates has been around since the 1970s when the original company was Gaviscon that came up with it, released the product. But for whatever reason, their product with enough alginate to actually work, they've got chewables, but the chewables don't really work. But their product that has enough alginate in it has only been released in the UK and I think maybe Canada. And so before ours and one other product, like the only thing you can do is order this stuff online, you know, from the UK version. But so 
one of the questions we always get is like, oh, well, your product has carbonates in it. And we're like, well, every alginate-based product has to have a carbonate in it because it's got a raft. But the studies are shown that it's not deacidifying the entire stomach, like what you're trying to do when you take a Tums. You really just get some minor deacidification in the area of the raft. And so you're not losing that I need acid in my stomach to digest food issue. And then studies have looked at it, especially in LPR symptoms, where if you basically you're not adding an alginate to the process, you're really missing a good percentage of your patient's ability to relieve their symptoms. Yeah. And does the stomach have to be acidic for it to work? You know, like if you have patients who are on PPIs and you're like adding this on, is that not going to be able to to raft if it lands in a stomach that is not acidic because of PPIs or H2 blockers? Yeah, you need some acid in the stomach for it to work, but who is it? GI lecture, I remember. And and if you're on one PPI a day, you're only blocking somewhere between 50 and 60% of your acid producing cells. And if you're on a PPI twice a day, you're still only up to like 80, 85. So people are still producing acid. And they've done studies showing that even with if you're on a PPI, adding an alginate improves symptomatic control. So yeah, I mean, if somebody is not making acid at all, like they've got hypochlorhydria or some autoimmune gastric atrophy, that they may have a problem with that. Yeah. It's not like you have zero acid in your stomach. Exactly. It just may take a little bit longer to raft than the person who's got a higher concentration. And you mentioned, so with reflux raft, you've added ginger, which is, remind me again how that works. So, I mean, just kind of historically, it's it serves as an anti-inflammatory and then the ginger is a prokinetic agent. Yeah, because I mean, you always hear about like drinking ginger tea after meals. Ginger tea or when you're nauseous, ginger ale. And so give it to our patients as they arise from anesthesia. And then the licorice. The special deglycerizinated licorice, right? DGL. And that's coating. And that's a coating. For your PM version, Reflex RAF PM, do you also have the ginger and the licorice? No. We just have the, we have the melatonin in that one, and then we have actual blueberry and Aussie berry powder, in addition to a little bit of extra blueberry flavoring, just to give it a, a brighter, a brighter taste. But we took out the other ingredients. Ginger is good, you know, but it's, it can be a little bit polarizing for some people, but it serves a purpose. And so we also just don't want to put ginger in every meal, but our goal is then all of our products have to have some additional ingredient to try to treat the or not treat the reflux, we're addressing symptoms, but to address the symptoms of reflux in a more kind of holistic and not a, not a single solitary way. Is the reflux raft formulation, is there like a recommended way to take it? Like as far as like when to take it, you know, around meals or how many times a day to take it? Or does it just depend? It depends on whether or not we're using it to treat overt heartburn symptoms, in which case it can be taken at the the time of symptoms. In general, though, for a lot of LPR type issues, you know, the recommendation is after meals and at bedtime. And so 15 to 20 minutes after the meal to allow the food to settle and intermix with the stomach enzymes and the acid, and then take the product after that. And it can be anywhere from one to three teaspoons of the product, which is pretty similar to other products on the market. And then the big question we get is, well, can you eat and drink after you've taken it? And you know, in essence, if you eat, you know, you are disturbing the raft. And if you're eating continuously, that's also probably not great for reflux because your stomach never empties. In essence, we do try to recommend against eating. But if you're drinking water, it will temporarily displace the raft, but then the raft will, will float back up because it remains that carbon dioxide in it. So it'll float back again. And then over three to four hours, the body gradually breaks the raft down and it moves through the GI tract and excrete it. But So after meals and at bedtime, so four times a day, potentially, that has to be decided in concert with the healthcare provider and the patient and the symptoms they're having and what specifically you're trying to treat with that product. Yeah. And because it's kind of just working in the stomach and not really being absorbed, I would assume that means there's much less problems with like interference with other medications or things like that. 
Yeah, there's no real cross reactivity. And then, like I said, the issue with the licorice root is non existent. There is some issue, apparently, according to some studies, with ginger and some of the transplant based medications. So, like tacrolimus, there's like one study out there that indicated maybe an issue in rats where it was studied. So, I wouldn't say that. So, I would say there's not no interactivity, but that's the only one I've heard of. Any contraindications? Are there any patients that you would say absolutely cannot take this? No, I mean, it's alginate-based products have been shown to be safe in children and in pregnant women. We've tried it on lots of the pregnant residents and or spouses of residents who have said it's the only thing that had finally relieved their third trimester heartburn and indigestion. So it's really a safe product for everyone. It's kind of actually amazing that more people don't know about it once you realize like how good it can be for, for treating these things. And safe to use kind of indefinitely as much as you need to. Right. The only issue could be, you know, for our product, I mean, you've got to put some sort of a preservative in all of these items that are going to be on the shelf so that they can be shelf stable. And so there's any variety of things. And, you know, because I had done the functional medicine training, I really wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything in our product which was going to be problematic in that regard, which becomes really tough because there's something about everything out there. And so... We ended up using an all-vegan, non-soy, non-corn-based glycerin as our preservative. So the biggest issue with that is that for some people it can be, you know, loosening the stool. But we have yet to hear a complaint from anybody about that. Yeah, that's the tricky part that the things we don't think about from a consumer side of it. So where, if listeners or patients want to pick it up and check out Reflux Raft, like where are you guys selling it right now, like online or? Yeah, we're fully online. Refluxraft.com is our preferred venue. You can find it on Amazon as well, but please support the small businesses with our with our website as opposed to Amazon. But yeah, it's easy to get a hold of and which we ship to anywhere in the country. And then for the cost of shipping, it can go elsewhere. But Yeah. And what's next for the company for Reflux Raft? Do you guys have any thoughts on other ways to incorporate alginates or other types of things you might want to, that you have your sights on for treating? We're still working on a couple of different flavors. We've got a couple of flavors in the hopper that we're working on with our R&D folks and our manufacturers. So hopefully within the next six months, we'll have at least one more flavor out for daytime use. And then I think globally, we do see ourselves as like a natural, holistic reflux therapy type company. And so long view, I would love to have other type of supplements that are non-alginate based that can be used for this type of thing. You know, right now we're just trying to get the brand out there. We're focusing a lot on education to fill in the gaps for a lot of patients who don't understand. And it's not just pushing alginates. It's making sure people do understand all of the things that you can do. And so like that's been a big portion of our social media outreach is just the educational component. And we've been working with a really talented laryngologist as well, Anna Hussein, who has just a passion for patients with reflux. I think she's even... May have even been on the show. She came on the show. We talked about reflex. (laughs) Yeah. And so she's heading up our educational campaign to just kind of like spread the word about like all things reflux related. Because in essence, the goal is to get people better. I would love it if everybody stayed on an alginate forever from a financial standpoint. But in essence, you know, I'm a doctor first and a co-founder second. And so like we just want to get people better. And this is hopefully another way we can help them do that. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. It's super exciting. Kudos to you guys for coming up with this and formulating and everything in your kitchen and figuring it out. It's amazing. I I love that that image of you guys just kind of mixing mixing things up and having all these jars. That's amazing. So if listeners want to learn more, you mentioned social media. What are your social media handles? Yeah, it's Reflex Raft. So you can go to Instagram at Reflex Raft and same for Facebook and LinkedIn. We've got a YouTube channel as well, some videos. So if you want to see me bloviate on about alginates and reflux, Jim and I have done some of our early work, which was less animated than I'd wish it were, but still informative to check out. And then, uh, yeah, refluxraft.com. And then any questions specifically related to that, people can email me directly, spencer at refluxraft.com. But I'm also customer service, so hello. And orders at refluxraft.com all come to me right now. So it's been really fun. So I hope to hear from your listeners. Well, there you have it. Everybody go check out Reflux Raft. Thanks for coming on, Spencer. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. It's been great.
Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Kinnebrew. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.